and I was a colleague of um, Florence Williams and a friend of hers. I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we stand today and uh, their elders past and present, many well present here today. It's a great honour to be asked to provide a few words about my former colleague, Florence Williams, who died 10 more years ago on Friday the 28th of August. Um, 2005. Loris Williams was very gutter uh, through her mother, that's in uh, Rant Air in North Queensland, and through her father, she was um, Mum and Jali, that's in South East Queensland um, in Bow Desert. And she had some familiarity with her father's Yugambeh language. Um, for those of you who may not know much about Loris, she um, graduated from Cavendish Road High School, so she used to talk about herself as being a road scholar. Um, <laughs> but she started her working life as a machinist in a factory, in a corsetry factory in Brisbane, before joining uh, what was Telstra in 1966. And she worked there until 1993 when Telstra was, you know, re well, lots and lots of people got made redundant, and so, she, so, so did she. So she used her redundancy money to enrol at the University of, Sy of Technology in Sydney and finally graduated after doing an associate uh, diploma and then a Bachelor of Education in 1996 with, with the Bachelor of Adult Education. In 1994 she joined the State Library of Queensland uh, in, in their Indigenous Resource Unit before moving to my workplace in 1998 which is Community and Personal Histories. In February 1999, um, she commenced studying towards her graduate diploma in Archives and Records Management at the Edith Cowan University, which she successfully completed in December 2003 with um, distinctions and high distinctions. Um, in between her work, her study and her family commitments, she got herself involved in all aspects of her new profession. She um, was the convener of the um, of Axilurn, the Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Library and Information Resource Network. In, uh, she was their president in the year 2000. Before that, she convened the 1999 Brisbane Conference. She also quickly joined the Australian Society of Archivists, and she was elected as the Indigenous Issues Special Interest Group convener in 2003. Um, also in 2003, she convened the National Indigenous Access to Records workshop held in Brisbane. And this was something that the IC first proposed in 2001 in response to recommend, recommendation 23 of the Bringing Them Home report about the development of common access guidelines throughout Australia. Also at the 2004 ASA conference, Loris and other members of the IC launched the ASA's brochure, Pathways to Your Future and Our Past, um, aimed at encouraging Indigenous people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, to uh, join the profession, the archives and records profession. In 2004 and 2005, she was involved in, in the planning for the Queensland Centenary of Women's Suffrage. Initially, the focus for this celebration was to um, acknowledge universal suffrage in Queensland. But after Loris's intervention, uh, it was acknowledged instead that it was really 100 years since uh, Queensland women who were not Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander or Indian, Chinese or South Sea Islander um, got to vote in Queensland. That's putting it fairly broadly, but you get my drift. And um, Loris's presentation at the University of Queensland seminar on women's suffrage also inspired Queensland artist Judy Watson to um, create an artist book which she titled A Preponderance of Aboriginal Blood um, based on this issue of, of lack of uh, citizenship rights for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Queensland even for those people who had got their exemption from the Control Acts until the changes to the electoral um, acts in both state and, uh, and 
Commonwealth arenas. Coincidentally, uh, Judy Watson's artist book and other artist books were launched on the same day that we held Loris's funeral. And Judy dedicated uh, her book, of course, to Loris's memory. Loris was an accomplished public speaker. The first time she spoke at an ASA conference was in Brisbane in 1999. And it was about her own experiences in accessing government archives. Her last public engagement was in April 2005 when she addressed the ASA's 30th anniversary seminar held in uh, Canberra. And her paper was on access to Indigenous related records from a community perspective. She had intended to speak at the 2005 ASA conference in Wellington and had provided an abstract to the conference convenience. Instead, uh, it, uh, um, Andrew Wilson and Kirsten Thorpe presented her paper based on uh, Loris's original idea. And Loris was to speak on identity and access to government records empowering the community. Loris's own experiences with the often painful process of interrogating records which were intrusive, patronizing, inaccurate, misleading, unkind, cruel, nevertheless left her with an enduring conviction that, that the key to the personal identity of thousands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today lies in the knowledge to be found in these records. She was big on identity in her, her words, who we are and where we come from. She was an important and significant member of her own immediate family and of course continues to be missed by them. Her role within her own family was one she never questioned, but it was her role as an advocate that uh, she felt sometimes uncomfortable with. She didn't like being centre stage, but it was something she didn't feel she could back away from. And there was a family joke about Loris that that she had graduated in activism and not archivism. <laughs> it is clear that for Loris, education was the key to opening many doors. And she often spoke about the importance of actively encouraging and welcoming and making it possible for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to enter our profession. In recognition of this, after her death um, at the, the 2005 conference in Wellington, ISIC member Jill Caldwell recommended that ISIC work with the ASA Council and Loris's family to develop a memorial, such as a scholarship or an award, to honour Loris's dedication, her generosity, and her professionalism, thereby ensuring that Loris's initiatives in developing archival services, which were valued by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and individuals, that this be both acknowledged and continued. The first Loris Williams Memorial Lecture was held in 2006, and the first Loris Williams Scholarships were offered in 2008. Uh, two scholarships have been awarded this year, one to um, Nathan Sentence and another to Marissa Timbury. And now, it's my great privilege to introduce our 2015 Loris Williams Memorial Speaker to the podium, Dr. Julie Gott. Uh, Dr. Goff lives here in Hobart and is a descendant of Tasmanian Ab Aboriginal woman Dolly Dalrymple. She has described herself as an artist and a freelance curator and a writer whose research and art practice often involves uncovering and representing conflicting and subsumed histories, many referring to her own family experiences as a, um, and her own experiences as, as Tasmanian Aboriginal She's curated some extremely interesting exhibitions, although I myself. Um, but her previous positions include Curator of Indigenous Art at the National Gallery of Victoria, Lecturer in Visual Arts at James Cook University, and in Aboriginal Studies at the University of Tasmania. She has many qualifications, including a doctorate from the University of Tasmania in 2001. With her most recent contribution has been to provide a chapter in in a really interesting book, uh, which was launched in, in Brisbane, Calling the Shots, um, Aboriginal Photographies, edited by Jane Lynn Lydon. I think it was launched in Brisbane, or anyway, there was a seminar based on it. 
The title of, of um, the talk speaker <coughs> today is um, Aboriginal Representation, Art and the Archives, Challenging the Perceived Parameters of Disciplines, Institutions and Audiences. So can you please make sure you Thanks very much. So, um, firstly, um, I, I live here in Hobart, my country, my maternal mother's country, which were Wolwe people from far north east Tasmania. So, I'm living on the country of the Moena people, who are no longer with us for reasons that we should be an audience that we'd be fully aware of. Um, but I'm welcoming you on behalf of the Tasmanian. Aboriginal people today, who hopefully you had a welcome earlier as well, but, um, who are now responsible for all of Tasmania, um, regardless of where we uh, originally were uh, living and uh, exiled from in the early 1830s. So um, <coughs> I'd like to thank Jenny Jerome for um, proposing that I speak today, which I'm excited to do, though, rather, um, uh, um, what would I say? I'm a rather um, reclusive individual, yes. So it's, it's good to get this opportunity. Um, the Tasmanian branch and the Australian Society of Archivists. Um, and I really do wish to pay my respects to um, Loris, who I have, didn't have the privilege to meet, but um, for her great work in, um, in the archives and for the Aboriginal people. And uh, also for this uh, lecture series that I'm part of, that is a really a great honour. So, uh, yes, I'm Sam Trevoe, um, eternally descended from Manalagena, Rotomotiana, and Delmipo Briggs, so the Briggs family line, some of whom are in Victoria to this day through uh, Delmipo or Dolly's brother, uh, John Briggs. <coughs> so, I'm going to present on interconnections between textual records and visual renditions made in or about the past and their interactive potential to multi dimensionally offer new ways to apprehend and extend our knowledge of history, and in this case, Aboriginal history. <coughs> so speaking specifically about Tasmania, or rather Van Demon's land, I'll attempt to simultaneously bring together colonial art, colonial records, or lack of, in terms of Aboriginal presence and voice, uh, and my contemporary art response to these. So, Um, the key focus is to muse on the little known cross cultural contact between Aboriginal and non Aboriginal people and to demonstrate largely through the artwork of commissariat storekeeper Robert Neal, uh, who was uh, born in 1801, passed away in 1852, and, uh, he, and of his contemporary um, Thomas Scott, 1800 to 1855, the government surveyor here. And so I'll be demonstrating the possible use value of some colonial art for Aboriginal people today in corroborating knowledge and information and expanding that about our history and cultural practices fragmented as a result of invasion. Amidst this, I'll present my case as a visual artist for how and why contemporary non-textual responses to the archives likewise offer fresh insights into the often disparate and disjointed records to new audiences towards ideally prompting reappraisals of the colonial past by the methodology of piecing together fragments from diverse uh, sources. And finally, I'll argue that a critical task of the archives is to foster partnerships, including and beyond institutional co-repositories of formal histories, such as libraries, archives, museums, and art galleries. So, uh, hence, this is primarily a visual presentation about the archives and natural cultural practices, people and history, and their relation to historic and contemporary visual art. So I'll speak to the images as, as we go. Uh, Robert Neal, aged 19, arrived with his parents, sister and brother into Hobart town in November 1820 on the ship The Skeleton. This is his work on the left. So he's uh, barely 20. <coughs> On board was Thomas Scott, a year older, also from Scotland. He would become a friend of Neil, and they would similarly encounter and depict Aboriginal people and their cultural practices. 
although travelling on the same ship, um, Clifford Craig wrote and suggested from Neil's own journals that Scott appeared to have kept to himself, travelling alone in steerage, unlike Neil's family, um, also immigrating from Edinburgh, but with, with his family rather than alone. So, the period of Neil's art production in Tasmania, from what survives, or what we know of at least, um, dates from 20, 1821 to 28. And it's rather interesting because it's intermediate between and even during the vis visits of the French to Van Diemen's Land from the late um, 18th century to the 1830s. It's a very early stage of immigrant art being produced, depicting Tasmanian Aboriginal people, and for private rather than public exhibition, it appears. Um, so Neil works slightly before the arrival of the work of the other, other British colonists uh, to who today we're more generally familiar with, such as Thomas Spock, John Glover, Robert Dowling, Benjamin Jibreau, Benjamin Law. <coughs> uh, another peer I want to mention, or friend, in fact, of Scott and Neil was Thomas James Lempriere, who um, also passed those same age, early 50s, and were there, was uh, working in the government government departments, as all three of them were uh, convict and surveying departments here. Um, but I think their position in, in life uh, as amateur artists was relegated their art production to be um, mostly hidden from view. They're similar in terms of public um, knowledge of accessibility and access, uh, access to. Their similar ages, independence of mind, curiosity about the world that they found themselves in and their similar ranks meant that they regularly crossed paths. And uh, Robert's own father and his father's cousin were printers in Edinburgh. So um, this is, it appears they had the strong interest in natural and social history uh, from the various societies that uh, James, Robert's father, and later Robert himself joined um, in uh, Van Diemen's land. So it seems likely that Robert himself um, in Edinburgh was um, was f uh, familiar with earlier publications, and so it's just the surmising on my part that, um, and seeing the similarities that he would have seen uh, etchings such as from, from the uh, French expeditioners to southern waters, such as the 1792 and 3 Dr. Castor expedition, and the works of Piron, and later uh, with Bourdain expedition, Le Sir and Petit. What's lost here, however, is the identity of the sitters and who are these Aboriginal people who allow this 20-year-old uh, immigrant to sketch them. Uh, unless Neil's, I, so this is interesting that I haven't found Neil's journal need to track how Clifford Craig is quoting from that uh, because uh, I live in hope that more information can be found um, to, to really yeah, provide the depth and detail I'm hoping for from the, this work and others I'll show shortly. So Neil lived in, in uh, Tasmania from 1820 to 1839 and Hobart from 1820 to 1830. 1830 to 1832 he was on Mariah Island on the east coast of Tasmania and then Port Arthur 1832 33 So several works I'll, I'll show will kind of uh, be, uh, you can place with, uh, in terms of location or what I'm trying to also uh, pinpoint where they may have been made. So Thomas Scott, just wanted to mention a bit more about him now. So he arrived on the same ship, the Skelton, and worked as a surveyor and produced a very an important uh, maps of various parts of uh, Tasmania in entirety and also um, surveyed as the town of Bothwell to the west of here. Scott's well known for his language list, 1821, the same year that Neil was sketching his double portrait. By 1826, uh, it's noted that he was friendly with uh, Aboriginal people on Bruni, South Bruni, sorry, North Bruni Island, uh, and where there was also an uh, adventure bay, so two parts of uh, two uh, places on Bruni Island, where there were um, with James Kelly and a whole, uh, uh, quite a few land grants have been um, 
distributed to ex whalers and uh, Aboriginal people continue to uh, congregate on Bruni right uh, up until 1829 in um, fairly large numbers. <coughs> so this work of Neil and Scott and also um, George Franklin who produced a map I'll show a little later, uh, the Black Line or the map um, created um, to demarcate the movements of the military and civilians across Tasmania in 1830 to uh, ostensibly drive Aboriginal people to the Tasman Peninsula. So George Franklin is part of this uh, mix of people that are uh, working yeah, for, for government departments and directly making, uh, having contact with Aboriginal people due to their mobility of workplace. And uh, in particular, the yeah, connection with surveying department, though Neil is a, a commissary and distributor of stores. Uh, this is uh, three, three uh, images from a sketchbook uh, works of Thomas Scott and also Robert Neal's sketches within uh, the Scott's own uh, book, which is held in the State Library of New South Wales. So Scott's piece to the uh, upper left, which reveals uh, scarred tree notches, which are um, rare to be found in in terms of archives or images. There's one photograph I know of in uh, Bisti property which shows uh, scars on a tree um, about 100 years ago. And valuable for this and it also indicates on the left where, where this uh, place is situated. And this is a kind of, uh, one of the aspects or one of the um, The evidence for the friendship between Neil and Scott. Um, working out where this is the the um, the river, Jones River, today over near Allendale, so on the west of Hobart, probably just over an hour west of Hobart. And uh, Bethune, Walt James Bethune, landholder. He, he uh, was in a partnership with uh, John Grant and so I just want to talk a bit about as we go over the, inter the kind of increased and uh, interconnections between the colonists which explicates not only where they are but um, the extent to which they're having contact with Aboriginal people and uh, how to navigate Aboriginal history in particular well, in Tasmania but I would imagine everywhere we have to, as it was mentioned, as Lois' as own work um, undertook to, to do, um, provide access and understanding that these colonial records are very much Aboriginal history as much as uh, what we find out on the ground in place and in story amongst community because within all of these documents we can um, figure and retrace our own pathways and ancestors' locations. It's just this sort of strange uh, parallel journey through the records to do so. So Bethune was a merchant, pet partnered with John Grant, um, whose brother James Grant uh, produced this portrait of Warrity, probably in 1830. A lot of what I'll be showing is from 1825 to 1830, in fact. And just uh, some, so now I'll delve into some art production of artworks of my own that linked to this period and then I'll keep moving in and out of the works of Neil and, and uh, Scott in particular to uh, show how um, the visual uh, as much um, provides um, information but also inspiration for research and output art and, and otherwise. Uh, these are land grants that I uh, typed out to try and you know, uh, physically figure uh, the lay of the land and how, how it has been distributed and how much uh, went where and to whom. And then trying to work out as an artist what can one do with such information. Um, and a lot of my work involves driving and looking and walking on place to understand how, you know, how to um, situate the, the records across the island to understand what people were particularly writing to Governor Arthur about in terms of Aboriginal people and so-called frontier. 
And so the idea for what to do with the land grant uh, uh, texts was to uh, produce a film where I drove through the, all of the counties of Van Diemen's land and the time it took for all of the land grants to scroll across the bottom according to location of the uh, counties is uh, determined the length of the film, which only myself and the film editor have suffered through, which is uh, three hours and 43 minutes, um, which was eventually shown in uh, the basin of Clarendon Estate, Nile River, North Tasmania near Evandale, um, James Cox's estate. So it was in the basement um, as this kind of hidden secret in a world of accumulation and, um, and <coughs> appropriate people exile lack of access. So, and you know, just an as another aside about this, what I'm finding quite interesting and difficult in, in uh, reproducing from what is held in uh, archives is um, how it can be misread because it's produced for a particular, you know, the, 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 this uh, information can be read two ways. For me, it's a sorrowful thing, uh, but showing it in the basement in Clarendon, I found out that our local landholders were coming and sitting and watching the films as names, so it was a point of pride. So this is something that's quite hard to figure out as an artist as to, um, you know, context is everything. But how much do you, exp I don't want to say you should feel sad, you know, be too prescriptive in, in the making of the work or too didactic. So it's, it's part of the challenge of working with records and information in this way. Um, and this is another uh, kind of extension of land grants where I work with the property top names and uh, the great amass, you know, amass them from uh, driving around Tasmania and also from the records in archives and newspapers. And so these are spears interspersed with planks that resemble the entries to the uh, properties across Tasmania. And Another version where I'm just uh, working from a map of the uh, grant through the, from that period um, created holes the size of musket balls. As a, this, again, this sort of how, how to make something uh, outside of text is also a challenge for me because I'm quite, I quite enjoy working with the written, but uh, determined to keep trying to work um, outside of that as well. These are. Um, Heading back into the work by Scott, on the left, that's his journal. It's also in Sadler, New South Wales. And uh, really interesting for me to see that he is having a close, you know, close, close contact with Aboriginal people, it appears. And uh, also the similarities to what the French were um, seeing with their own eyes. 25 odd years earlier or so um, with the, in the Bordan expedition, this creation of the shelter lean to part. Um, and then this is a jump to another kind of hut because uh, uh, something that I find uh, troubling is uh, the um, way that often Aboriginal history is uh, before, sort of before colonisation, before arrival, and then you know after 1803, and that there isn't this crossover period when, if we're talking 1825, say with Scott and uh, people living in a tribal way here in Tasmania, at the same exact time we've got Aboriginal people who are servants and uh, wearing Western clothes. So this is really strange and interesting and you know terrifying time frame, time you know, period is something that I'm quite obsessed with trying to understand. So this is a few images about um, the, um, an incident involving Darwin Paul Briggs, my ancestor, um, who was uh, shot at in 1825 by, um, until I read this document, was, um, it seemed possible that people that she lived with, uh, so Jacob Mount Garrett and his wife Bridget, who have been referred to in lots of published texts as kindly benevolent and adopted her and taught her to read and write and so um, this, this document held in the uh, National Library in Canberra, the original manuscript, um, clearly shows otherwise. So 
just the importance of actually making this public and also through art, but in another in another way. Um, for me, brought me into kind of the digital realm because uh, it was my first blog in uh, 2009, with, um, as res results of reading these uh, these records. So I went in, I'll go back here. Yeah, so it's called Manuscript 3251. I'm not sure if anyone's from the National Library of Australia in, in here, but the, the manuscripts part was very helpful. Um, and I applied and was successful with the Manny Clark House Residency, Copyright Agency Residency, um, because visiting Canberra and reading the one um, one, tr one uh, account in the volumes wasn't enough. It suddenly became evident that everything in there needed to be uh, liberated for, for people to access their own histories. And I could see how much of it is involving Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people together in the same stories. So, you know, from this, this uh, led to yeah, the application and award of the residency in Canberra and the uh, eventual online upload of manuscript 3251 as a resource. So the tr uh, transcribing took about six weeks because I'm not really quite slow, but um, not so slow now with copper plate writing. But it was uh, quite riveting and at the same time. So there's this sort of terrible um, allure of the archives for me as much as a it's quite um, just, um, easy to feel distraught with some of the episodes that one encounters. So um, that's the blog on the left and the later blog, Black War, and now I have around 10 of them online dedicated to different uh, historic uh, periods but also uh, different cultures as well actually. So this is uh, at the time, so this became an artwork from reading the account of the event which was that Dalrymple Briggs living at, um, apparently at this hut that now is moved to Brickenden Estate, uh, to Mont, to um, Woolmer's Estate. Sorry, I'm on the wrong picture here. There we are. Uh, this, this hut is apparently the hut outside which the shooting incident took place in 1825. Dalrymple herself said she was upwards of 12 years of age. Had Three witnesses rode past, the Brumby brothers, who still live in the district, not them, but their descendants. And um, <laughs> uh, maybe they're ghosts too, but uh, also a man called Thornlow, who worked for the government. They came upon the immediate aftermath of the shooting. Dalrymple is uh, bleeding. Uh, Mount Garrett is standing firm um, on the, uh, the porch, wherever that's gone, gone to. And um, they write, they make their way to Launceston to report the incident. Um, so the case is overturned because Delvinful Briggs uh, is sent for heads into Launceston and basically says that she was shot by accident. Mount Garrett was, um, the moon was out, it was a dark night, there were trees. He was really aiming for a possum but got her instead. So it's a really unlikely, but um, very um, strange account. There's a lot more embedded within it. Um, two other small children are living there. One she refers to as a black boy. This, this, uh, this has very much led to ongoing search for Aboriginal kids that are kind of missing and hidden within um, colonial homes, colonist homes at the, at, at the same period. Uh, that, this is where I think mentions a black boy found the opossum my master shot before the other uh, men rode up, of course, conveniently disappeared, the uh, possum. So as an artwork outcome, I uh, created a, a fireplace that, with no fire and uh, with a dead apple tree, sort of symbolic Tasmanian <coughs> edifice. Uh, two versions of this artwork have been um, produced for Canberra and also for Melbourne. And uh, this, this work is a later work with a perimeter of fencing of the colonial property names. The, the floor is covered with um, the fabrication of Aboriginal history uh, by Keith Mitchell. Uh, so, and this is the early version which um, doesn't have the perimeter. Whilst pacing this down in the gallery at um, ANU, 
the School of Art Gallery, which um, I was allowed to do that till it was late at night, about 11 p.m. And uh, a disturbing and also a um, affirming event happened at that time, which is uh, in, in highly in the realms of improbability, which was a possum actually walked in <laughs> and walked across the work <laughs> and walked out of the gallery, leaving footprints. And, and that's something that, yeah, uh, Nebia, yeah, it's unforgettable. And also the next morning, showing there's a, these strange things on the surface. So, and I did hear that ANU has a possum problem, but I prefer to think it's not, she, that was not actually, it did not seem like a regular possum to me. <laughs> <coughs> so yeah, that was one example of moving something out of the archives and uh, for others to access other audiences than would usually perhaps do so. But the whole account was on the mantelpiece at the, at the back above the fireplace, extinguished fireplace, for those that wanted to read the different versions of this account. Mount Garrett been brought in to um, state his case, said he could, he, he could do what he liked with his black servant. So this doesn't uh, tend to suggest that he was benevolently adopting this girl and um, what has been published um, since the 1820s seems fairly um, incorrect in terms of his motivations and behaviour. Um, but he's also well known for being present in the um, infamous uh, events at Risten Cove in 1804, which um, still to this day are uncertain the extent to which I've been able to um, kill and driven at that place. And so, this is a work about um, Dalrymple's mother, Rorita Mortiana, um, and uh, more clues that I have about her life. One of which is that uh, she was sold to another sealer from, Jane, uh, from George Briggs to John Thomas. So it's created a closed book. Um, the kind of menacing, beaded uh, ornament on the cover and a spideress. And, um, and so what next work is also starts with Rorita Mortiana's name on the top left, but these are all the women's names I can find so far back then by 2007, Aboriginal and Tasmanian women who were kidnapped, uh, taken by sealers, traded by sealers, removed um, from country by, or kept away from country by sealers in Tasmania. And back now to looking at some works and uh, where Neil is going to intersect Robert Neil with the work so of uh, of the of the French visitors. Uh, so so I think not only is he inspired by at an early age, but he comes to meet them, it appears, in person when they arrive into Tasmania. And there's various expeditions and trying to unpack which um, who encountered which expedition and where is is difficult but so the the top is a print after Le Sir, Mariah Island. And his um, depiction is of the, the sailors disturbing tombs, so called as the French name them. They're huts, but they're actually for um, the cremated ancestors on site. And then from the bottom is the, the sketchbook uh, held in the State Library of New South Wales. Um, and there's a lot here from State Library of New South Wales. And, of um, great value. It's difficult to understand this, but um, Arago, Arago, the sketchbook, the sketch of this is by Arago, Jacques Arago, he was on Freysenet's later expedition uh, voyage on the U Urani uh, to, the, to the southern seas, 1870 to 1820. So I'm not quite clear here if, if, uh, if Arago is, is kind of copying something you know, copying the earlier the Bordan versions, of which there are expeditions versions of, of what they encountered on Mariah Island, or 1817, 1820, oh, sorry, up to 1820, uh, whether he himself saw these uh, same constructions sim at a later time frame on Mariah Island. But um, yeah, I think they're important um, 
I, you know, either which, which ever of these, or is there something else, another explanation? So I'll come back to this sketchbook because it's very important. Uh, with uh, a sketch by Robert Neal that has gone viral since it was um, handed, I think, to the French during their their visit. Then this is a later expedition of Jim Montreville to Hobart. Now, looking a bit at maps, so Thomas Scott, who we've been looking at, he, he uh, created the map to the left, which is the same map that John Batman used whilst um, traversing particularly northern Tasmania as the uh, leader of one of the roving parties. So, quite sinister. This uh, the next image will also... I'm not sure if you can see on the left, but uh, Batman has, I think himself, delineated the possible uh, movements for the next map, the black line map, that Franklin, Franklin uh, creates. So they're, they're marked in pencil on the... So that's, uh, that's an interesting history of what, what was occurring. And this is 1830. So what I'm indicating, presenting from these various sources and that, that are held arbitrarily between archives, libraries, universities and art galleries and museums, is how they can provide a key to the genealogy of colonial interconnections by which Aboriginal people can locate our own history, otherwise often missing. And these resources provide a often well-concealed logic for how the land was occupied by whom and when, and uh, allow us better to be better equipped about where else to find material battle by our ancestors, um, including uh, their own uh, connections with and cultural practices at places. Uh, so strangely though, a lot of my cultural practices appear to be responding to or trying to unpack what happened in the past. Um, I'd like to see and think there would be a day when I wouldn't need to feel compelled to do this, but I think it's part of the history of absencing that I'm uh, devoting so much time to try and work through and represent these uh, difficult and often little known aspects of our history. This is a uh, work in response to the map and work and running at particular locations on the so-called uh, black line, uh, so ration and other distribution points and uh, running eventually from the south further up the northeast coast to end in, uh, in my own uh, maternal ancestral country in uh, northeast Tasmania, so at the top which is here. And so wearing these trousers, directly because of the quote from Robinson's journal where he said, I issued slops, which are clothes, to all the fresh natives, gave them baubles and played the flute and rendered them as satisfied as I could. The people all seemed satisfied with their clothes. Trousers is excellent things and combines their legs so they cannot run. So it's kind of this expression um, retort to that is to get on some trousers and run like the wind, which being particularly unfit was not easy, but we gave it a, a go there, um, running at these sites. And this eventually led to me realising I wanted to work with video as another way to move across time and place differently. And so that's been, and then, and also thinking more and more about digital terrain and uh, other means by which to reproduce um, differently what I'm finding in the archives. So this next piece is an uh, invitation to make a work, uh, again in response really, to the Bothwell Cup, Silver Cup, Robinson's Cup, held in Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery, um, gifted to George Augustus Robertson in gratitude for his uh, good work in removing Aboriginal people from Tasmania. They eventually ended up in Bath in England, where he returned to from here in 1851, and then somehow to haunt us, came back uh, with Robert Robertson's papers in the post-war period to Geelong and eventually to Queen Vic Museum as a cultural gift. So I made a film where I just kept um, navigating around and around Bothwell and going through Bothwell and coming up with a story that the place seemed to provide through people continually lighting fires and uh, the text from old newspapers, from newspapers of the time through Trove really indicating to me um, the savagery of the colonists in determining to remove um, our ancestors. 
So this is Jorgensen's journal, which ends up with, with the Scott family, interestingly, and he was also leader of the Rome Party himself, John Jorgensen. Let's keep moving through. And Mount Morriston, Robert Neal painting the home of, of uh, Scott, Thomas, and his brother, uh, brothers up near Ross. I'm not sure where the original is, it would be great to see that. But this is another indication of their close friendship. And the uh, recent work by myself of uh, driving past all of the colonial gates slowly as I could uh, from, the, from the Black Line period, from 1830, um, kind of stalking the homes, including Mount Morriston, and collecting a small stone from each gate area and uh, projecting it on a wall, the stones on a colonial large uh, expanded table. Uh, so it's sort of the indoor outdoor looking through a window at the, 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 the spoils of war, pretty much, as I see it. And um, this was in, exhibited in Ballarat Art Gallery recently for a group exhibition. And uh, it's online. Um, so most of the films I've made are online because I, they get very limited. That's the thing with being contemporary artists is most work is only shown for four weeks in a gallery. So it's um, slightly problematic in terms of, yeah, the effort versus the um, public outreach potential. So this same uh, property, Mount Morriston, was attacked in September 1830 by Aboriginal people who waited a few days uh, after the military presence who had been stationed there for 12 months were removed. So they're obviously um, watching, watching Mount Morriston. And uh, it appears, therefore, if they know who Scott was, that maybe initial friendliness, so accumulation of language words, of depicting them, cooking them by their huts and hunting uh, what's happened by 1830. It's um, heading in a much more serious direction. At this same time, Scott received a letter from Franklin, George, the uh, other the cartographer, surveyor. Um, he was told to hold himself in readiness for embarking on the Black Line and attaching himself to John Holden Wedge's party. It's very kind of, um, these interconnected histories are interesting in working out why people are also not overlapping and avoiding each other. Um, so this is a map by Scott, Thomas Scott of Port Sorrel, far north, Tas north central north Tasmania, we call it northwest, but uh, and here on the uh, top right, it's, he's marking the spot where um, Bartholomew Captain Thomas and his overseer Parker were, were killed. This was the last um, known attack um, and killing of colonists by Aboriginal people and uh, uh, led to great outrage and really formalised the idea that all Aboriginal people needed to be removed from Van Devers Land to Flinders Island which um, then I think led to Robinson's um, funding to do so by the government appointment to continue removing people even from the west coast, far from um, occupied territories. <coughs> uh, this, this before some more work showing um, my kind of <coughs> reproduction of the text into um, something sculptural. This is uh, Charles Meredith who had, uh, was whaling and held land on the east coast in the Swansea area. And he, he was asking after the, so a year after the Black Line for people to be sent across. It's uh, sinister if you can read the <coughs> last couple of lines. It's a, it's a um, language, clandestine language, asking for people who were uh, accustomed to killing Aboriginal people basically to come ac across because uh, Aboriginal people slipped through a later version of the Black Line called the Freysenade Line. And uh, so Meredith's requesting assistance of this, of this na nature. His own son, uh, George Meredith, was killed about four years later in South Australia by Aboriginal people. And he was infamous for um, <coughs> kidnapping and bringing Aboriginal women from the mainland to the Bass Strait Islands to uh, seal this there. So it's a more complex history to unpack with, uh, with that family.
This is a um, so you're using text. I'm working with pins in the um, in this old chaise, and they're spears, kind of converted into legs. So a kind of creature that could possibly run off, and it's relating the story of how these uh, apparently savage Aboriginal people can be uh, captured by two broom makers, and one being a cripple. So the question. Um, Yeah, how savage were uh, our ancestors here? And uh, this incident reports is a work where I uh, burnt into Tasmanian notebook Taz Oak, which is interesting, it's kind of terminology for eucalyptus uh, timber, the, um, from uh, newspapers and also uh, reports to Governor Arthur. Arthur. Uh, so by, by location, so it's a kind of mapping burnt into timber of, um, of uh, conflict. Um, violent murderous conflict between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people here. And a, a film work, a river's run of uh, violent encounters directly drawn from the uh, records here. So it's correspondence to and from Colonial Secretary's office about Aboriginal people and um, these encounters happening on river banks. And a poster series, which is in a response to, um, in 2007, this was the Australian newspaper headline. Uh, so I just, that day, was thinking how ridiculous and how interesting that Australia be this, so Aboriginal people be this, perceived as this one amorphous mob when we're so many different people and countries with so many different histories. And Tasmania is kind of, you know, what could be the Northern Territory in some generations, like we are the warning of what could come if uh, people are not, um, you know, fully conscious of the, of the possibilities. But so, yeah, here are our ancestors in the 1828 to 30, 1826 to 1830 period, speaking back well and truly in English um, to the colonists. So it's just another kind of, uh, yeah, that response directly to um, living in the present and continuing looking back at the past. This is a loose looking at maps and the importance of this one in particular by Halia, which is online, uh, Tarbo, and so many places that don't, uh, not reproduced on later maps here show the um, mention of uh, Aboriginal people's names, tribal names, also um, cryptic, cryptic uh, places like Black, uh, Black Crow Country, which I think can indicate the actual presence and possibly um, the dis deliberate dispersal of our, of our ancestors. James Scott in the 1870s, um, after his brother had uh, passed away, Thomas in, in, in Scotland, was asked to come forward and, and, and well, asked to prepare notes on Aboriginal people. So by this period, um, there'd been a resurgence in mainstream interest this is the uh, 1870s. Um, I think at the time when we were, our ancestors were no longer perceived as a threat. And uh, so, again, the family is uh, showing up as um, they're providing information that can be useful today about what, what happened and where, where we were in, across Tasmania doing, doing what to each other, in fact. The, this is the sketchbook, back to the sketchbook of the State Library of New South Wales, uh, which held the Arago sketch of the Mariah Island um, Park um, cremation tomb. This is a sketch um, signed by Neil. So somehow it's ending up back here but in New South Wales. And then it becomes this well-known etching during the Jim Deville um, produced in the um, publication after Jim Deville's expeditions to Tasmania, or to the Southern Seas. In the Astral Hub and Zale. So they made three stops in Tasmania, three, um, made landfall three times for um, several weeks each time. And uh, <coughs> it became a really wi widely distributed and modified print. So stuck, there we are. All of these different versions. These just don't tell us as much as a couple of works I want to quickly show you by Neil. 
in a moment. But um, on the bottom left is the is the drawing also held in Stratton, New South Wales, which is um, truly fascinating. It has holds lots of uh, cultural information, but this just shows the kind of um, West has got European art history more so than Aboriginal content, really. So apologies for it being so um, indistinct. I'm not sure if you can see it really well. I had to make it a bit darker to um, show the delineation of the people. So there's no date, no location, no city's names. That's with the print. Um, but the expedition, Dumont de Ville, their voyages, they uh, come to Hobart 17th of December 27 to 5th of January 1828, this and um, later in 1839 and 1840, by which time Neil is uh, working and living in King George's Sound in West Australia. Uh, but so during this period, um, Neil is working in the Hobart Commissariat stores, the time. Um, of the print, and I think this uh, this is also 1828 January, when the uh, French is still on, uh, in in uh, Tasmania, but for a few short days. <coughs> During their French visit, um, their journals indicate that they spent time with um, some young men on one occasion climbing the mountain, which I assume is Mount Marjum, or yeah, uh, adjacent. And uh, they note in their journal, a young man who was a guest at this meal uh, in Sullivan's Cove in December had been to the interior. So I think that is probably Scott. There are just some uh, details there, just to show you uh, the baskets, the food, the way that the people are moving through the country, carrying fire. It's really an uh, interesting work. And, uh, I think that the, perhaps these drawings, and it's unknown, so I don't know if don't know when the, the uh, drawing they showed came into the collections, and it's paired drawing, which is a uh, hunting. The other one is called reposing, where the people are making their way across the hills. Uh, this is in the Lemprier sketchbook. Uh, attributed to Leprie, who's a colleague of Scott and Neil, and a little bit of information in this work. I haven't seen the original, but uh, it's, I think it's possible that these works came in with Leprie. I mean, I can, I'm not at all sure. It's just uh, they, they're closely connected through through um, correspondence. It indicates that Neil is sending uh, Leprie who replaces Neil at Port Arthur as commissariat. Uh, Neil is, being, is sending Lemprier pencils and uh, Lemprier sends Neil a cartoon he's drawn. They both become deputy assistant commissariat generals. And so and, uh, Lemprier's daughter married Scott's um, ex-boss's um, author Surveyor Evans' daughter. So this is a third person in the mix who is also encountering and very little known about his depictions of Aboriginal people, but that sketch that he showed is, is one example. So uh, this work is uh, this is showing. Oops, <coughs> sorry. The, trying to understand the locations and Murray Island being a possibility, uh, but that it's uh, again hard to see, but we're worthy of more investigation. The um, landscape behind the sketch. This is the second work that's um, dated, not just January, but 6th of January, 1828. Um, the French in the Dumont de Ville expedition leave Dr. Castro Channel um, on, the, on the 5th, according to various journals of uh, sailors on board. So I, I believe that Neil um, was spending time with the French during their visit at that time, hence the, the sketch ending up in, in French hands of the simple reposing sketch that later became the print. And then, so I think that because it wasn't evidently happening in Tasmania, colonists were not drawing, painting, or I think spending time with Aboriginal people. Uh, Scott's an anomaly, and I think the visit of the French spurred um, this on and encouraged 
and inspired him to spend time with um, our ancestors. I want to show you something that is, um, I think, really, for me, important culturally about this work, which is showing a man and woman of the same slightly advanced age hunting together a wallaby with people in the background um, creating a kangaroo kind of run together uh, over the hills. So there's a strategic hunting technique shown clearly, but also importantly it shows the woman, for me, uh, spearing the wallaby while the uh, part, her probable partner is holding the body. And um, it, to me, clarifies what I've suspected for some time, which is that women did hunt with spears, which is something that's been um, contested and discussed here for quite a time in the Aboriginal community about. So this is like another way to try and understand what might have been happening, which could be possible. So um, combining the song that was collected by um, Backhouse and Walker, the Quaker missionaries, while they were in uh, northern Van Diemen's land, uh, on the northwest and also on Flinders Island, they, they wrote down the song that they were um, sung, and it, uh, it starts with the married woman hunts the kangaroo. And uh, then combine that with uh, Emmett, and that's another manuscript in the National Library, 3311, which shows, uh, well, has a, there's a quote here from Henry, Henry James Emmett um, about the precision by which a woman, a woman threw a spear and a man on a horse and knocked his hat off. Got this terrible problem called no time, so can I finish in the next couple of minutes? Is that, yes, yes, yes. I could give part to you tomorrow. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the body in the uh, same, this is the sketch uh, reposing, the earlier one, and the, the detail on the handle of the body um, mirrors what's held in Queen Vic Museum here in Tasmania, but also in the um, British Museum in London that went back with Backhouse and Walker to Yorkshire, the Quaker missionaries were given heaps of Nicholas's baskets, bodies, and um, so this kind of correlation between is really helpful for, for me to also believe that Neil himself was there and that these documents do provide us uh, more, more potential reading and meaning of uh, beyond the only written accounts that we um, have inherited. Perhaps I'll just go to the very end conclusion bit. Yes, um, I didn't make it to the, to the painting. Um, this is just showing you our potential locations in very bad watercolours. And uh, the painting again, just quickly showing you the detail. Um, again, and if, how much I can surmise that Neil was um, kind of inspired by and relating to his knowledge of earlier French works of family gathering. Or was this, you know, what he, it says uh, from life on the back of the work. He didn't live to see it exhibited. In 1851, it was finally exhibited publicly in Hobart, interestingly. And um, our baskets from that same period, uh, or slightly later, in the collections of T-Mag, adjacent to the hotel. And a basket made in the probable 1840s and 2007. And uh, if you can see this uh, continuum of culture and also reclamation and making again and learning again is very strongly happening here to this day. So, let's read that here. So, just, so uh, colonial art can offer much by way of useful details about Aboriginal people, not only cultural practices, but location states, potential relationships with those who depicted them, us, our ancestors. We can seek to recognise the cultural elements in the work that are by may be bypassed by others. So building a picture, a map of everyone, everywhere, here, who likely made contact during this disastrous period, disastrous period uh, will for Aboriginal people help fill gaps in knowledge and give direction for where more information and material might yet be located. Multi-dimensional, large-scale digital pop possibilities for this research and output beckons. Um, I'll just flick through one reading speed up as well. Um, so, we've inherited in this colonial aftermath a largely impenetrable abyss. Most colonists were co-conspirators in the attempted erasure of Aboriginal uh, Tasmania. A few made their alternative thoughts known in the newspapers or, or their journals. Now, this is a small island. Many of us are descendants of participants in the Black Line from both sides of the frontier. Uh, so, Aboriginal people undertake research that uh, feels often illegal and sometimes stymied. 
So I'm passionate about locating and liberating these often hidden Aboriginal histories within the archives and other institutions, but I often feel like I'm stumbling about not quite knowing the right questions to ask, to whom, for the doors to properly open, uh, to find the documents, to keep compiling the evidence of what happened pre 1830s Van Diemen's Land, and my output feels often accidental. Maybe I can put this online and you can look at it later. Um, I have a frustration with academic secrecy and ownership of the past until it's published, um, and any separatist approach between the past and today. Um, some archivists, so archivists and some researchers are exception to the rule, and contact Aboriginal people with uh, unearthed information and references. So I'm fortunate in this regard. I'd like to thank Fiona McFarlane and Ian Morrison and Tony Marshall from Tahoe here in Tasmania for undertaking this practice with me over many years. A critical step forward is for the archives and interconnected institutions that hold Aboriginal content to be opened up, for Aboriginal people to be actively welcomed to these shared sites of history to make of it what we will um, so I'm hoping for projects that enable co collections to be awakened, contextualised in much broader terms than previously imagined, collaborations between disciplines other than history and protagonists other than historians, uh, to produce outcomes that will necessarily challenge the usual cultural models of time, place, object, subject. Uh, the call for projects to be proposed, developed and led by visual researchers should be a priority, I think, with multi-dimensional outcomes produced for any one or across several of these institutions. Working in this holistic way that reflects Aboriginal cultural values and interrelated knowledge systems, board participation, realistic timeframes, promises new levels, not only of engagement with and from collections, but the building of alternative frameworks and methodologies by which to interrelate and reconsider our past. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much.